so I want to talk about what those changes are. Uh, the first is um, we're making some changes in the way that we're encouraging compliance with the policy. Uh, the first is that um, progress reports, non-competing continuation awards will be placed on hold, will not be processed until the grantees demonstrate compliance with the public access policy. Um, the second thing is that use of my NCBI uh, will be required to report papers when electronically submitting progress reports using the RPPR. So if you're using the RPPR, you have to use my NCBI. Um, third, to make this whole process parallel, if you're using the PHS 2590, that is the uh, paper version of the progress report, usually for complex awards, um, you have to, you will have to use the my NCBI um, report feature to generate that publication section. And we'll, we'll talk about that as well. Um, all of these changes are going to take, come into effect when the RPPR becomes a requirement. And so this is going to be no earlier than April 2013 and we'll have a, an additional guide notice uh, when that date is, is solid. Uh, just so to give you a quick overview then on, on some of these terms I, that I mentioned. What is my NCBI? My NCBI is a tool that's integrated with PubMed, our database of abstracts um, that helps people manage citations, uh, public access compliance, and, uh, their, and now their public access reporting. So for our purposes, what's important is that these can be linked to ERA Commons accounts. Commons linked users can associate publications with NIH grants, which becomes a really useful way for authors to collaborate in compiling these progress reports for their PI. Um, you can track your public access compliance. And again, now it's going to be the only way to enter publications for uh, reporting purposes into the RPPR or to be creating the publication section of the PHS 2590. Uh, Bart's going to give us an overview of that in a, in a little bit. Um, but as this is all keyed around the RPPR, uh, I'm, I'm wondering if any of you have worked on an RPPR or process an RPPR uh, as part of um, while it's in this um, phase in period. And while you, while you fill that out, I think maybe uh, Scarlett can talk about the RPPR. So I'm going to move it to Scarlett. And do you have now mouse control? Uh, I do okay. not yet, no. But I'm that's gonna... okay. You know, you can go ahead and keep the mouse control if you want, Neil. Okay. I have okay. only a couple slides here. So. All right. So let's let's go to the um, display. Oh, okay. Here we go. Can folks see that? Okay. So most of you have not worked on the RPPR. Uh, so. What is the RPPR? Oh. Uh, the RPPR uh, is the research progress um, research uh, project progress yeah research progress performance report. <laughs> so it would be if any of you have used uh, um, the 2590, the form 2590, which is the NIH progress report form. It's uh, taking over the 2590 as uh, the federal wide form for reporting on your. Um, the progress on your grants. So that now, is what we're moving into. And I should point out that Scarlett and uh, some of our other folks from our OER already gave a really nice webinar on the RPPR, which is available at this URL here at the bottom. I, I really encourage you to look at it. it they, they did a nice job. It's very helpful. Ah, great. Thanks for the glowing uh, the glowing review there, Neil. I appreciate it. Um, our, the policy folks did a really good job, and I um, managed to help them out a little bit with it. I am the system person. I do uh, manage the ERA Commons, and we're going to talk about the RPPR at this point. As Neil spoke to earlier, the only way to get the publications into our system is through the MyNCBI um, application, which Bart will be covering in detail in a couple minutes. But let's go uh, to looking at what you'll see once those are in. This is what is going to show and display on your RPPR, um, on your progress report. And when we move to, uh, com to where we're using the progress report for all of your streamlined um, um, reports, which will be coming up in April or a little bit after, depending on then, um, we will be looking at this screen. So as you can see, there are there is a section here where it says that nine items were found displaying um, that are associated with this particular RPPR, or actually not associated 
with this project but are in my NCBI. Now if you had associated um, publications with this project already in my NCBI, it would already show up at the top. And one of these is non-compliant at this current moment. So that one, if you were to select it and put it onto your RPPR, you would then have a non-compliant publication that you will be reporting on your progress report. And that's when you will be looking at something that you need to, the actions that you would need to do after the RPPR. So the others have been completed. Completed means that at this time they are compliant and that will be okay. So that can, this can be reported and everything will be fine. And uh, there's ways to sort these. You can sort by date of publication, by author. Um, you can do it ascending or descending. Um, it's very easy that to manage these things. And once you've put them on the RPPR and the RPPR has been submitted to NIH, then there is no changing that. So what happens if that happens? Next slide. So on the next slide, a grantee submits an RPPR that associates one or more publications with the award that had that non-compliant status on it. We send an e-notification out. We let the recipients, basically the PI with a CC to your administrative officer and your signing official and to the grants management specialist at NIH and the IC that uh, manages that grant and which is your institute or center and your program officer will also get a copy saying that this grant has been sent with a um, progress report that has a non-compliant publication on it. At that point the grantee may respond to the e-notification via an email to their pro um, program officer usually is where it goes or there is a link that will now open up in the comments under your status where you find your RPPR links or at the current time your eSNAP links which are your progress reports for um, your SNAP eligible um, grants and it will say PRAM that stands for progress report additional materials at that point you'll be able to click on that link and submit some sort of explanation as to how you're going to get into compliance or why you're out of compliance to your program official um, Neil, would you uh, like to explain what you would think you would people would want to see in this? Yes, uh, I th the the appropriate response for a non-compliant paper would be to include in this text right here the full citation with the PubMed Central identifier um, if it's more than three months after publication, and if the paper is in press or newly published, you can include that PubMed Central. I'm sorry, the manuscript submission ID or the um, PMC journal and process. And again, the best place to get this information is from the MyNCBI account and then you can just paste that citation in, in here. Um, so, so that's the example of, of handling the workflow through the RPPR. Through the uh, 2590, uh, we have a place to report publications and we're using the MyNCBI to generate essentially the same thing, uh, but in a PDF format. So you'll notice here uh, we have a place where you generate the form, it'll ask you for the investigator name so that appears up in the top uh, header as it does in the 2590 and then if you like it gives you the option to put in the continuation page number um, so in this case it's page 73 and then subsequent pages for the publication report will be will be numbered as well 74, 75 and so on. Of course you also have the option to leave this part the page number blank if you want to manually uh, if you want to write in the page numbers, you know, at a later date. But we, this, is, this report is issued from my NCBI, so it includes all the public access compliance statuses in, in the very easy to read format uh, with the column on the left, just as it does for the RPPR. Um, and so we're hoping that it'll be very clear to you uh, when you're processing this award if this award is in, compli in compliance or not. And so everyone knows what they need to do to get this award into compliance and there should be no surprise uh, when you get an email then from your program officer saying this particular award is not in compliance. So why, why are we making this change? Um, the, the 
as you know, this is a statutory requirement for us, for NIH. This is something we have to do. Um, and we find that our compliance rates are pretty good now. They're around 75%. But our growth in compliance, our increase in compliance is starting to slow. Um, so we have to do something. We have to make a change. On, in addition to that, though, we have this new opportunity where we have better IT systems. Uh, we have our RPPR, which is more automated for us. Uh, it's more accurate for users. It's easier for everyone to understand. And when we did our uh, the first phases of our pilot, also showed that things were moving along in, in a very positive direction. Um, so we find that the papers in the pilot, we found that papers reported in the publication section using MyNCBI were almost three times more likely to be compliant than when authors didn't follow instructions and put their papers in text where they wrote in the citations in the scientific progress section. Um, so that's good news. We also found that the MyNCBI interface with the RPPR is working pretty well in that people were more likely to report papers in the publication section than they were to write papers in the text section. Um, whereas when I looked at a sample of eSNAPs from the same program officers submitted at the same time, you know, a comparable selection of eSNAPs, they were twice as likely to report papers in the text section. So when PIs use the text section, they don't report what's going on with public access correctly, they may not understand, and they're more likely to be out of compliance. And the way this all works out is just in our pilot, before we announced this change in our compliance strategy, before anyone was, was additionally sensitized to public access, um, our PPRs were third more likely to be compliant than a comparable set of eSNAPs. And since we made this policy announcement, we've already seen an increase in compliance, and I expect that's going to be occurring as well this winter, and I'm going to be doing another look at the data as it comes in. Um, so that's the change. That's how it's going to be um, implemented. And I think this is another good chance, a uh, good time to pause and take some questions before we give some overview uh, details on the MyNCBI system and the compliance monitor. Um, so do any of you, I haven't been really watching the questions as though they've been coming in. I think maybe some of you have seen some. Do you want to? Absolutely. Discuss? So sure, we have a whole bunch of, um, of questions. Some folks are asking about my NCBI, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually hold those questions until, until after our folks from uh, the National Library of Medicine talk. Um, so let me um, ask a few. Um, so uh, this one, I'm not sure if it's for Scarlett or for Neil. Uh, Stacy is asking, um, so they have publications that are resulting from, you know, contractor funding. Um, there's no link to these awards in ERA Commons, but they're funded through NCI as a subcontract. So how do, how do they cite those? They should still, based on your previous um, answer, um, they should still be putting those into PubMed Central. Correct. So they should still be posted to PubMed Central. They should still have a PubMed Central ID for those whenever they cite those papers. Um, um, is there a max number of articles that are retrieved into the ERA Commons, um, Scarlett? No, there is not a maximum at this time. We retrieve everything that's out there from my NCBI through a uh, web service, actually, that um, we've been working with BART's team on. And there's actually no maximum currently for reporting um, on the RPPR, and there's no maximum for what you retrieve into your um, Commons account into the report. Um, the one thing you do want to be aware of is that's one of the reasons why we gave you the, the pluses and minuses and the capability to associate to the grant ahead of time. That gives us the capability to um, limit what you see on the screen so that you're not overwhelmed by the amount of publications. Some of uh, the PIs out there have a lot of publications in there um, under their names and that way they can limit it to just what they have already associated in my NCBI on that grant. Um, and so, Scarlett, how will subaward uh, publications be included with the RPPR? Well, we're still working on the. Um, um, are you are you live? No, sorry, I, I pushed the button the wrong way. <laughs> um, yes, uh, they we are working on the complex 
mechanisms just as we are working on getting them in electronically we're following that with the RPPR reporting on them electronically and we um, hope to actually have a, a pilot in um, October of next year that is a goal uh, that's not a uh, that's a squishy date I'd like to say but we're looking at that and then the publications will go on to each um, Actually, they'll be reported on the overall at this point. So it'll be reported on the overall sections, but there'll be ways to report the sub-projects separately. Great, thank you. Uh, Neil, Joanna is asking um, about non-compliance uh, and non-competing continuations. Um, she wants to know, she wants to understand, you know, um, <laughs> if the award will be held for the PI or the organization. So I think, you know, here's where we need to emphasize that NIH makes awards to organizations and not to individuals. And so ultimately, um, is this true, Neil, that the organization is responsible for compliance? That's true. That's correct. Great. Um, let's see. We have uh, lots of other questions. Um, um, if an institution is making a good effort but is not completely compliant, what should they do or what happens? Well, uh, I guess related to the previous question as well, we're looking at compliance per award. And so we would expect every paper on that individual award to be compliant with the policy uh, when we when we are going to process that, that progress report. Um, it's 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 a straightforward process. It's um, every paper should be compliant. Um, I'm pretty sure the answer to this is no, but let's just check it out anyway. Uh, Dee Dee is asking whether any publishers consider deposition of the author's manuscript a previous publication, and is this negotiated with a publisher? To my knowledge, that's never been the case. I've never heard of that happening. Um, but again, this is something, this is a good reason why authors need to let their publishers know in advance before they review the article, you know, preferably as soon as they think about submitting that paper, that this is an NI supported paper, it's going to need to comply with the policy. All right. We've actually had multiple questions asking about center grants. And so, um, you know, centers have authors that are affiliated with a center, but they're not necessarily receiving direct um, funding. Is the PI of the center grant responsible for making sure that any publications by all those authors are in compliance? If they are receiving direct support from that grant, then the PI and the institution is responsible. That's true. And the same holds true for trainees on training grants where the trainee may not also be an author, I'm sorry, an employee of the institution. You know, a couple folks are interested in, this is a good sign, submitting papers that have no NIH funding. Uh, you you can't do that through systems designed for the public access policy. You really have to work with your publisher to get paper on a PubMed Central. And we have uh, now several thousand journals that submit some or all of their content to PubMed Central regardless of funding source. But that's something you'll have to work out with the publisher. All right. Do PubMed Central IDs need to be included in the references cited section of the ac actual application? Uh, technically, yes, if they're your papers, that is, if, if they arose uh, from the PI's funding or if there's a paper that falls under the policy and the PI authored. Um, if, if um, Megan, you were submitting your application and you wanted to cite the paper that Bart Scarlett and I uh, wrote, you wouldn't need to include the PubMed Central ID because you had no role in that paper at all. Fabulous. Um, so Elena notices that the policy does not apply to reviews. Does this mean book reviews, reviews such as uh, Cochrane of Review, or are they both excluded? The, the policy applies to any peer-reviewed article in a journal. And so sometimes journals call things reviews that are peer-reviewed. And so if they're peer-reviewed, they fall under the policy. Cochrane reviews are not journal articles, so they do not fall under the policy. Book reviews and journals often aren't peer reviewed, so they don't fall under the policy. But if they were peer reviewed, then they would fall under the policy. And the, and the reason why I'm, I'm vague about this is because journals can call any section of their journal anything they want, and the titles aren't necessarily consistent. And so we have to go by not the title or the content, we have to go by the process, which is in a journal and peer reviewed. 
makes sense. And so I think that gets to this next question, which um, Barbara submitted, um, which means that, um, so which type of articles do not need to have a PMC ID numbers? And that would be anything that's not peer reviewed. Correct. Right. Okay. I'm learning. Um, do you want to keep going? We have lots of questions and we yeah, can keep doing this forever, we, but. We, we better keep going. And, and as you'll see, when Bart talks about um, uh, my NCBI, there's a, there's a good way to figure out what's excludable and what's not excluded using my NCBI. So, so let's, let's move forward. And Bart, you should have uh, control here. Okay, great. 